the Falkland Island War, turning point in the UK in many respects. Let's go. The Falkland Islands are an archipelago in the South Atlantic, which has been ruled by Britain since 1833. It is 13,000 kilometers away from Britain and 650 kilometers away from Argentina. And while the Falklands are British territory, Argentina has historically had a claim to the islands, which they call Malvina Islas. Argentina had been ruled by a military junta after the 1976 coup d'etat. A new junta, led by the acting president General Leopoldo Galtieri, Air Brigadier General Basilio Lamidoso, and Admiral Jorge Anaya came to power in 1981 amidst a grave economic crisis. And Everybody's got a claim to everybody else's land if you go back from day zero, right? So that part of it always seems like a mystery to me. Did the Indians have it? Did the so-and-so have it? It just never ends. At some point, somebody controls the land, it's their land. Civil unrest in Argentina. The junta viewed invasion of the Falklands as an opportunity to divert people's attention from internal problems and unite Argentinians around a potential national victory. That's nothing unique to this general. How many times in history, question for you guys, have you seen bad economy, bad whatever in society? Next thing you know, we're off to another war. The junta knew that the Falklands issue is very sensitive for many Argentinians. A member of the junta, Admiral Anaya, who was the architect of the plan, strongly believed that it would not be difficult to conquer the Falkland Islands due to a small British military presence and the unwillingness of the UK to enter a conflict so far away from Britain. Argentina started the invasion of the Falklands on April 2, 1982, with amphibious commando troops under the command of Lieutenant Commander Guillermo Sanchez Sabarots landing near Cape Pembroke. The Argentinian invasion forces were 600 troops strong against 50 to 100 British troops in the Falklands. The Argentines were able to... I know that was a big point of contention in 82, how the UK was not staffing, I'm going to call it, their protectorates. In other words, very few troops on this island. Um, it changed things. You guys remember that, where it changed the way the UK thought about its patriotism? And hopefully, things like this, because there just wasn't enough UK military to protect the island. Defeat the British in the Moody Brook barracks, and then take the government house in Port Stanley. This effectively meant the defeat of the British in the Falklands. Argentina was able to gain initial success, suffering just one casualty. This was the first time a British territory was invaded by a foreign power since World War II. Britain responded by creating a war cabinet and deciding to send a task force to regain control of the Falklands. The War Cabinet was meeting daily, and it is said that Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was very attentive to propositions by the opposition, but was resolute in execution of decisions which had already been made, and never looked back. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. After several days of rising tension in our relations with Argentina, that country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control. The task force was gathered hastily and started setting sail for the Falkland Islands on April 4th. Some vessels of the task force left Britain as late as May 12th. The task force consisted of 127 ships, 43 Royal Navy vessels, 22 Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships and 62 merchant ships, including two aircraft carriers. Britain had 42 aircraft versus 122 Argentine aircraft. How do you think that war would be fought today? I think what would happen would be it'd be a smaller force, quicker reaction time, air superiority, and maybe some ships. I don't think we'd have this much troop movement from 13,000.
thousand kilometers away. Britain's strategy was to secure complete air and sea dominance around the Falkland Islands through its navy and aircraft before the deployment of ground troops. Britain wanted to create a so-called exclusion zone for 200 miles around the islands to prevent any Argentinian vessels operating around the Falklands. Argentina tried to counter this strategy by surrounding the British Navy gathering in the northeast of the Falklands from the south and the northwest of the islands. On May 1st, British operations on the Falklands opened with the Black Buck 1 attack on the airfield at Stanley, which did minimal damage to the aircraft runways of the Falklands, but at the same time prevented the Argentines from stationing their air force directly on the islands. On May 2nd, the British submarine HMS Conqueror sank Argentinian light cruiser ARA General Belgrano, which forced the southern part of the Argentine fleet to we're not talking about a comparable army here with Argentina's military. Now, they did think the Brits weren't going to do anything, obviously. They thought they could take it, and 13,000 kilometers was too far for the British to come and fight. And they were wrong. ...back to the mainland and effectively killed the plan of surrounding the British Navy. 323 crew members of the General Belgrano died in this incident, which was almost half of the total Argentine casualties during the war. Argentina retaliated two days later with the sinking of the destroyer HMS Sheffield with an Exocet missile. Britain was not able to secure complete dominance of the air and sea around the Falklands, but still decided to proceed with deployment of its troops to the islands, despite the risks. On May 21st, the 4,000 men of 3 Commando Brigade were put ashore as follows. 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment, 2 Para from the RORO Ferry Norland, and 40 Commando Royal Marines from the amphibious ship HMS Fearless were landed at San Carlos. 3rd Battalion Parachute Regiment 3 Para on the amphibious ship HMS Intrepid landed at Port San Carlos, Green Beach, and 45 Commando from RFA Stormness were landed at Ajax Bay, Red Beach. On this island, it's a lot of mountains, so you're coming in at a beach landing, and you're going uphill. I'm not sure, and question for you guys, would it have been better to send in the Paras or somebody jump them in, get the high ground first, then make the beach landing. Makes sense to me in hindsight. Argentina strengthened its attack on the British Navy with an aim to destroy as much supply and support as they could to make the lives of British troops in the Falklands as hard as possible. The following vessels were destroyed between May 21st and May 25th. HMS Ardent on the 21st of May, HMS Antelope on the 24th of May, also lost on this day was HMS Coventry, and MV Atlantic Conveyor on the 25th of May. You, know, you don't realize in these battles the amount that goes on to you study them. And this was a significant battle. The amount of ships destroyed, the amount of air superiority and air fighting that went on amongst both sides was very substantial in 82, because not much had been going on from the UK's perspective in the world. Now in 83, the US was involved in Grenada, but not to this magnitude of operations. Argentina had 2,000 of its troops in the East Falklands, 1,000 at Goose Green, and around 10,000 in the Stanley area. It is necessary to note that despite numerical superiority, the majority of the Argentine troops were conscripts which obviously meant that the Argentines were at a disadvantage in comparison to the professional British troops. That's always easy to say that they were conscripts when you're not fighting the war, right? Most militaries around the world are conscripts. So I don't think that has any bearing to do with who's shooting at you, right? 7th of May until the 28th of May, two para, approximately 500 men, with artillery support from 8 Commando Battery Royal Artillery, approached and attacked Goose Green, which was held by the Argentine 12th Infantry Regiment. 
the Argentines were on the ridge, giving them an advantage over the British troops. Tupara intended to complete the battle during the night. I just wonder if they would have waited for reinforcements of helicopters. Would this have made this mission much more effective? Because coming in from the ground and going up to get the high ground is a tough way to do battle if you can avoid it. You got the paras there, you got lots of folks that can jump out of planes or fast rope in. It would save a lot of time instead of trying to take the high ground this way. The British were able to succeed in pushing the Argentines deep into Goose Green after 14 hours of intense battle due to the decision to send two companies to move around the ridge and surprise the Argentines from their left flank, and the timely attack of two Harrier jets on the artillery positions of the 12th Infantry Regiment. Both sides were exhausted. Despite being in a precarious position themselves, the British commander Keeble decided to take his chances and send a request of surrender to the Argentines in a very confident and demanding tone, threatening them with bombardment. The Argentine commander Piaggi reluctantly agreed. As a result, 961 Argentine soldiers were taken as prisoners of war by the British. A significant part of the Argentine troops were defeated. By June. Argentina was testing the UK, right? They tested whether they'd come down that long ocean trip, 13,000 again kilometers. Then they wanted to do what they could, but it's like fighting your little brother. They're going to get beat up. They're just testing the big brother here, that being the UK. First, a further 5,000 British troops arrived, and the offensive on Stanley was to start. The plan was to proceed in two stages. The first stage was to defeat the Argentine troops in and around Mount Longdon, while the second stage focused on Mount Tumbledown. The success of this plan would open the road to Stanley. The supplies and reinforcements were to be transported by the Royal Fleet Auxiliary in Bluff Cove on June 8th at night, but due to a lack of coordination, the operation had to proceed in daylight. This was spotted by the Argentines, and they launched an airstrike on those ships. As a result, the British suffered their heaviest single loss in the Falklands War, with 56 servicemen killed. He expected that the losses would cause enemy morale to drop, and the British assault to stall. The British assault on Mount Harriet, Two Sisters and Mount Longdon started simultaneously on July 11th, after a long and painful march from San Carlos. After heavy fighting, Britain succeeded, despite losing 33 of its soldiers. Argentina lost 59 personnel. On the night of June 13th, Britain defeated Argentina at Mount Tumbledown thanks to the immense bravery of the Scots Guards. Who do you think was the most impressive unit in this battle? So we have the Scots Guard, we have the Gurkhas involved, the Paras, the Royal Marines. We've got a big group of people here. But who do you think, in your opinion, put that in the comments, I want to hear, and put why. On June 14th, a ceasefire was declared, and Britain was in control of the Falklands. Argentina lost 649 servicemen versus 255 British losses in 74 days of conflict. The Falklands War resulted in the restoration of British reign over the islands. Thatcher's conservative government became more popular and won the general elections in the following year in a landslide, despite being behind in the polls prior to the start of the war. The military junta was ousted in Argentina, partly due to the defeat. That's an ongoing discussion in America. It does seem like before an election, there's some type of conflict. Not saying there's a reason for it. That's a theme I've noticed. What do you guys think the reason for that is? Channel, thanks for stopping by. For my current subscribers, I appreciate you. Thanks for watching.